my topic today is don't waste a virus and it comes from the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 which says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord to them which are the call according to his purpose but you know what we have a problem here we read in the book all things work together but that is not what we really hear. We hear some things work together or some good thing, uh, things only work together. But that is not what scripture says. It says all things work together, the good and the bad, the negative and the positive, the mountain and the valley, the good times and the bad times, they work together, not separately. The good things and the bad things, the negative and the positive, the good times and the bad times, God says that they work together, together. Even this pandemic, I believe that what the enemy planned for evil, that God will turn around for good. Amen. Now, someone once said, you never want a serious virus to go to waste or a serious crisis to go to waste, really. And he goes on to say, and what I mean by that is an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. So what good can come out of this pandemic? Now, I'll tell you something. A crisis always forces change because it causes us to see things from a different standpoint. And you know, we all know that we resist change until change is forced upon us. Read the yeah, lockdown. And we resist change until the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of change. Uh, you know what I mean. You'll continue wearing uh, that tight-fitting shoe that you so like until you can stand it no more. Now, during this time of crisis, perspective matters because having a view from the top, from where God sits, changes everything. You know why? Because you gain the perspective of past victories. You gain the perspective of seeing present opportunities and also future eternal glory when you run into the presence of God. I'm talking about the place right where God's, God sits. So when you enter that place, you begin to see from God's perspective. As a child, remember, when you became afraid and you would run into your parents' arms, the barking of the dog, the monsters under the bed. And once you found yourself in their arms, all those uh, things, fear suddenly looked different to you because when they lifted you up and hugged you, your emotions calm and peace returned to your little soul. Do you know that it's the same when you run into the arms of your loving Heavenly Father because that's your place of safety, you know, your place of, of, of healing, your place of transformation, and it's also your place of perspective. You see, when you're lifted in His arms, whatever seems huge and impossible becomes small and possible. And uh, the truly important things that you couldn't see before, they now come into proper focus. So during this uncertain time of the coronavirus pandemic, which co has confined most of us to our homes, you know what? I hear people complaining about being bored with all the extra time on their hands. But how often 
I want to ask, have those same people complained before? I just don't have the time. Well, now you certainly do. How many times have we in times past said, I wish I had more time, or, you know, I ran out of time. Well, at present, it matters not with whether you, you are young or old, rich or poor. The bottom line is that we all have before us the precious commodity called time. So don't bury your new spare time in the dirt of the uh, disorganization and disarray, in, dis in, in discouragement and depression, and, and not capitalize on this tremendous opportunity to improve yourself in some practical area, and most of all, in uh, your spiritual life. We are admonished in Ephesians chapter 5. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeem here means to make the most of or to buy back. Now you can't turn back the hand of time, but you certainly can buy back your remaining opportunities by cashing in on these temporal moments God has purposely allowed us through this pandemic. I call these opportunities, these glorious opportunities, second chance, chances for us to grab in order that we could accomplish something important, which the tyranny of the urgent had constantly robbed us of in the past. Now, my friend, is your great opportunity to reinvest your days for the glory of Jesus Christ before he comes back again. Now, coming out of this global uncertainty and the fears that prevail, we are witnessing something for those of you who carry that, that sensitivity. We are witnessing what I call an awakening in the spirit of man. And I believe that it is some an awakening similar to the one that followed 9-11. You know what? In the midst of this present turmoil, People are searching for answers, and more and more people are turning to God for guidance, for encouragement, for healing. The prophet Amos, Amos puts it like this. He says, there is a famine in the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. This pandemic has forced us, you know, to see the frailty and vulnerability of humanity. And it has really, really exposed the helplessness and the hopelessness of nations, of governments, and of global institutions. And as a result of that, there is a genuine thirst for a connection with God. Now, you will agree with me, over the years, our generation has enjoyed material abundance as no other generation has. And we will have to admit that food, water, and medicine have never been so readily available. Accessing luxuries has never been so common. The world, as it were, has been at our fingertips through the internet and through global travel. But you know what? In the in the, the, the busyness and the noise and the clutter of, of all of this, hearing the voice of God has become increasingly, increasingly more difficult. So you know what? This is what I see in all of this. 
God has stopped us, literally stopped us in our tracks with a virus that so completely changed our lives. And uh, he has literally brought us back to basics. So, you know what? We have returned to our homes. We have had to return to our families and to our private inner worlds to silence and get this to a much simpler way of life and living. My friend, it has never, never been clearer that the world is ultimately in God's hands and not in ours. If there was any time at all in human history, it could not have been clearer than now at this present time of the total bankruptcy and disaster, I call it, that is secular humanism, despite all the advances, the global uh, economic power, and a quantum leap in medical science, research, and technology. Listen well, my friend, listen well. I hear in my spirit, God is saying, this is going to be the finest hour for the believer in Christ worldwide. So this is a call to the church, the body of Christ, to, yes, become salt and light, a city on a hill, declaring, thus saith the Lord, declaring the, today's voice of God in response to the spiritual call of our time. Yes, there's a yearning, there is a call, there's a desire, there's a hunger to connect with God. And this is where the church comes in. This is where you and me come in. Because God has called us to do our little part wherever we operate. Right now, under this lockdown, access may be limited to just those around us. But please, please capitalize and maximize on this glorious opportunity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm talking about this spiritual call amongst everyone included. Yes, your family and relatives and neighbors and loved ones. This spiritual call in searching for God, in finding ourselves. People are, are asking those questions. And, uh, and the spiritual call also in reaching out to one another. Hallelujah. To reach out to each other. It's, a, it's, it's a spiritual. So concerning this topic, don't waste the virus. I want to bring up perspective from scripture concerning this time of national shutdown. As inconvenient as this period of enforced shutdown is, for many, you know what? It has become a time of reflection, a time of introspection, a time of inner deepening, a time of soul searching, and it's, uh, it's also been a time of growth. And I would like to call this a time of Sabbath rest, a time of coming back to God's original plan, a time of divine reset, which is changing lives for the better, for every one of us. So I have been describing the, I believe, this time when God has brought us back to self soul searching, to self evaluation, to a place of silence away from all the din and noise of uh, the normal activities that we attended to. I believe that by force we are being brought back to God's original intent and plan, which I call, in, which scripture calls, a Sabbath rest. 
Now, I'm in no way, I want to get this clear, I'm in no way making a case for legalistic Saturday Sabbath keeping, neither Sunday nor any other day for that matter. Instead, I want to present here this morning an open door, what I call a sacred challenge, an invitation to you from Scripture. Listen to this. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. And then Psalms 118 tells us, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For uh, this, this is a, 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 an invitation to you to appreciate that, that the Sabbath is a gift from God to enjoy it. And for you to recognize that all days, I want you to read the time there. All days are hallowed. Time is hallowed. And that hallowing of time is, is not in some special day, but hallowed in a time of rest, which we call Sabbath. And uh, a time of Sabbath, which I want you to know, is in a person called Jesus Christ. So, in Christ, hear this, we are seven days Sabbath people, not seventh day Sabbath keepers. Our great Jewish thinker, Abraham Herschel, here, here's how he described the Sabbath. He described it as a sanctuary in time because he noted that the word for holy, <clears throat> which is kadosh, used in scripture more than any other word represents the mystery and majesty of the divinity. And the first thing described as holy in the Bible, the very first time in the book of Genesis at the end of the story of creation, this word, Kadosh, was used not for any object, not for some kind of mountain or an altar. It was applied to time, ladies and gentlemen, the seventh day, a period of time, not a day per se. This is what the scripture says, and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So it was, I want you to see something clear. It was not the day per se that he made holy, but a period of time. So this word kadosh, which means holy, is a period or sanctity of time. And that sanctity of time is what God called holy. See, a lot of people are getting mixed up in a day. So that sanctuary or period of time, as I said, is a sanctuary or a rest. It is a rest in a person called Jesus Christ. So those of us who enter into the Sabbath rest, enter into the holiness of Christ. And it is in that sense in Scripture that we enter into a sanctuary of time. And that sanctuary of time, my friend, was filled in a person and not in a day, which just foreshadowed the person in the Old Testament. So what does this sanctuary of time mean for us today? What does it mean for us now during this COVID shutdown? Well, before COVID-19, you remember the busy schedules of a non-stop life with the work and the kids and home and responsibilities and personal needs and friends and hobbies and so on. A lot of activity, but not a lot of rest. I mean real rest, real rest, reflective rest, renewing rest. The kind of rest 
that invigorates and recharges. The kind of rest when you get your head clear, when you get your priorities straight, when you rise above the fray of the busyness of life and you begin to see the big picture. I am talking about a divine rest, my friend. I'm talking about seizing this uh, unique moment in history right now when we are forced to shut down, shut down so many of our normal activities in order to seek God for deep, lasting changes in your life and for fresh and clear direction in your future ministry. Seeking not only to be more productive quantitatively, but seeking qualitatively to be more still, waiting, listening, resting. Oh boy, never had we had an opportunity like this to get to that place. Hallelujah. To be still and know that he is God. You know, that brings to mind uh, Israel just about to cross the Red Sea. And here is the Red Sea, the impossible Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army at the back, their corner. And you know what God said to Moses? Be still. And you will see the salvation of your God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where victory, that's where overcoming victory. That's where uh, 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 um, power over you know, the, the negatives of your circumstances, that's where it comes from, you know. By taking time to be still. And God is saying to us, hey, you need to get back to that place of being still. And you know what? Out of that place, out of that time of being still before God will come a deepening in the inside, a renewing and a refreshing in your soul that only comes from the presence of the Lord. How many of us have been longing for that place? But you know what? Our busy schedules prevented us. We always had a good fancy excuse. But now we have no more excuses. Now this faith rest life I'm talking about is found in Hebrews chapter 4. And I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is not a faith faith, strive life that you find in legalism. It, it is a faith, rest life. So I want to tell you up front, striving in your Christian walk needs to go on vacation. God never called us to strive because we need a faith, rest life where we hold on to the promises of God. Not preoccupied with a striving mentality, the kind of mentality that says, if I don't do this, if, if I don't keep this, I'm not going to be blessed. I'm not, God is not going to hear me. God is not going to answer me. I would not be able to obey God. We keep striving and striving and that kind of striving comes from trying to keep a so-called Sabbath day instead of a Sabbath time of rest. So whether that time is Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever it is, that's what we are uh, aiming at here. That is what I believe God is saying to us. You see, the uh, legalistic Sabbath keepers, they have accused us, uh, the Christian church, of changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. No, the only reason that we gather on a Sunday, the Lord's Day, is because it's the most convenient day of the week. 
But what the Sabbath rest that I'm talking about can happen any day, ladies and gentlemen. What happens if the authorities were to change a Sunday to, uh, uh, to, to some other day? What if they were to restructure and rearrange social activity in such a way that our Sunday now falls on a Wednesday or a Thursday? That's the day we will choose to gather. So it's not about changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. It's about Sabbath time. A time, a sanctuary of rest that many of us are missing. And I want you to know this according to Scripture. Jesus is the resting Sabbath man. And every born-again believer in Christ, you know what? We have that Sabbath man in the inside of us. So there's no need to strive. All we've got to do is to rest up in him and his finished work. He fulfilled the promises. He fulfilled the shadow of the Sabbath day in the Old Testament. So Sabbath is no longer a day. It is a man. And when you rest in the arms of Christ, when you rest deeply in the love of God, his deep love will surround you like a wraparound sheep. So there is no more striving. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So it's a faith life. Resting up. In Christ Jesus and we rest in the arms of Jesus by faith yes the Bible says and some legalists will try to, to uh, you know contest this faith without works is dead but you know what the scripture also tells us that our works must come from a place of rest we do not work for rest notice that God instituted the Sabbath rest. That is where we go back to the law of first mention in Genesis to understand what this Sabbath is all about. God instituted the Sabbath rest before he created man and before he gave man work to do. The Sabbath came before. So we always rest in Christ before we decide to go into works of faith. Because works of faith are really the works of Christ in and through us. So if you're not resting up in Christ, where are the, uh, uh, those works are not going to be faith works. Let me explain this a little, a little more. The Bible says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You see, worship always comes before service because you have to be, literally, you have to be before you could do. You know, it was Jesus who said, I do nothing of myself. What I see the Father do, I do. In other words, what he did, everything that he did, was from a place of rest in the Father. So you see, we get to rest in Christ in order to see and to know what to do. But the problem with us Christians is that we have been taught wrongly. We have been indoctrinated into a lie where we thought that in order to impress God, and it's really, really was to impress others, to show people how spiritual we are. We began doing, doing, doing without being, being, being. You know, even in Acts 1 and 8, when Jesus said, uh, and you shall be, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, see, you shall receive power and you shall be witnesses. You see, you can't do witnessing before you become a witness. You have to become. You can't, you can't give what you don't have. So we've ended up with all kind of uh, intellectual approaches and evangelism. And I'm not knocking things like four laws and so on and so on. But you see, in 
in order to produce life, you have to have life in you. Because once you are honestly and sincerely give what you have, silver and gold have I none, but what have I, give I unto you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, arise and walk. You can't give what you don't have. So the problem over a time in Christendom is that we begin to do before we Sabbath or rest in Christ. And I want to tell you this, you know, I love you, but I need to tell you this, as good and noble and spiritual looking and well intended uh, are some of the things that you do in the name of Jesus, if they are not initiated and energized by Holy Spirit, they are still works of the flesh. You see, they got to come from God. So let me change gears a little here. What happens when the shutdown ends? What happens when your busy schedule kicks, kicks in again? Well, the key, my friend, is a weekly reset, a mini shutdown which I call a Sabbath rest. Not in a legalistic sense, but I'm sure that you can, you're learning now that you can discipline yourself. You can extend what is happening right now in your life. Take it to another level. And I'm sure that you can find one day in seven to be in church to spend quality time with the Lord, to put aside everything else, and to be still a Sabbath rest. You know something? Before the shutdown, you literally had every day of the week and every hour of the day on schedule. So I'm simply saying to you, why not leave an hour open each week? and decide to do something completely spontaneous before God. And let that be the start of your journey to a weekly Sabbath rest. See, that's different from striving to honor some day as a holy day. And I'm saying this, if you do your best, to schedule a divine reset in your life on a regular basis, perhaps you may begin to understand why God called the Sabbath holy and set it apart. See, as you live out the lessons you are learning now during this crisis, finding that sanctuary in time would certainly, would certainly give you great benefit the rest of your life. So a view from the top, as I said before, changes everything. Now, very quickly, here are three aspects of a view from the top that you gain from running to God's presence. Here, here then. The first has to do with your previous battles won. Your three perspective that comes from this time of stillness, of Sabbath rest. Now, you may not have realized it, but up to today, you have survived 100% of your worst days. God's presence has seen you through tough times, and you not only survived, you know, you have grown. There are things that you have learned about yourself and about God. God along the way. I mean, opportunities you have experienced, skills you have developed that could only have come through refusing to give up when things seem impossible. As a person, as a human being, I'm sure you've been through difficult things before. And so has your family, your church, and I'm sure now your country. And I want to tell you this, whatever you may be in, whatever you may be in right now, 
I want you to know this. Based on that past, you can face anything. You can face that that is before you as well. See? So in order to strengthen along the way, look back and notice what helped you to go through those tough situations before? What kind of mindset was helpful for you? What type of type of spiritual and emotional nourishment strengthened you? How did you steward your energy and how, uh, 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 and how did you exercise appropriate self-care? Did you ask for help at any time? What helped you to hear God's voice? And what did he say to you? And how did he show up in your life? Now, while your present crisis may be greater than what you have been through before, you must know that, that the substance developed in your soul in those past battles has prepared you for where you are right now. You see, it's the bear, it's the lion that you conquered in the past that empowers you now to defeat your Goliath that you are facing now. Our faith, the Bible says, is refined only in the fiery crucibles of trials and tribulations. And God's available grace is always sufficient, my friend. You know what? Small skirmishes. They prepare you for greater challenges and they tell you that you can make it. Hallelujah. The second aspect I want to bring of a view from the top that you gain from the uh, uh, Sabbath rest of running into God's presence is this. What does this lockdown situation make possible for you right now? See, many of us are seeing this pandemic situation as a stimulus to make changes we know we should have made a long time ago. Truth be told, when things are calm, it's easy to fall into patterns that limit our personal growth. Some people crumple in crisis, while, while the same crisis brings out the best in others. It is said, really, that it's hard to distinguish the fake from the real when times are easy. But it takes pressure for the real diamond to shine through. My friend, this crisis provides the perfect opportunity for true leadership, for true innovation and creativity and resilience to come through, to come out, to come forth, knowing that the first person you lead in any crisis is yourself. You know what? How you handle things today could well decide what God will allow you to have tomorrow. The impact that God will allow you to have. Yes, I admit we do have our up days and our down days in life. And especially so in how we are handling this virus on a daily basis. Yes, there are days when this disruption to our lives will leave us listless and disoriented. But the good news is that in spite of that, we know how to regroup. And we use the skills that we have developed along the way and we, uh, so that we can refocus and now is that time to refocus really on the reason why God still has us here on planet Earth and we still have life in our bodies. Remember, stress is not eliminated as we navigate this, this crisis. Stress simply puts the crisis in the proper perspective for us. The third perspe perspective uh, I want to introduce here that we gain from running into God's Sabbath rest is this, that we keep eternity before us all the time, which begs the question, what story are you telling yourself 
right now. And where are you in that story? And further, how big is that story? Chances are that one of, uh, one of these may sound just like your sto story. It may be, well, this virus, this pandemic is only a small temporary interruption and soon enough, things will get back to normal. Or is your story, well, this is a welcome reset and I'm so glad I've had this opportunity now to slow down. Or is it this virus, this thing is real, it is horrible, and I'm sure, I'm not sure, in fact, that I'm going to make it through to the other side. Well, here is an eye opener for you. If you are telling yourself any one of those stories, you know what? Your story is not big enough. It's just not big enough. Even if your story widens to include not only yourself, but uh, other things as well, your country and, 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 and the economy and the, the food supply and restructuring and, and, and so on. Still, your story is not big enough because like it or not, Ladies and gentlemen, God is not about bringing us back to normal. He is, he is not, and I stress, not bringing us back to how it was before. See, in the Apostle Peter's day, there were scoffers and they were saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. My friend, this COVID-19 story is not, and I say not, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Our world is rushing towards a climax, and we are in the season of knowing that we are near the end of the story. How near you ask? Well, I do not know, but what I do know is that we are in the season of the end. And for those of you who need a reminder, the book of Revelation tells us that at the end of the story, it is our Lord Jesus Christ who wins. Hallelujah. So know what? God will never be content for things to get back to normal, whatever our definition of normal is. The Bible says that evil will get worse and worse to the extent where the church will have to be raptured before that seven-year tribulation period. And uh, 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 that tribulation, such as the world has never, never seen. We talk about global plagues, pandemics, pestilences, natural disasters, earthquakes, deaths, uh, murders, famines, wars, and, and the list goes on, and, 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 the list, and, and it goes on. And, and when we look at those things, they are going to make COVID-19 look like a walk in the park. My friend, God will not be content until this planet and the heavens melt with, with fervent heat and he recreates a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more tears or death or sorrow or evil, no more pandemics. All, the Bible says, will be made new. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. And we, the church, the church of the living God, shall reign with him forever and ever and ever. All power and dominion, glory and praise to God's Lamb, Jesus Christ, who sits upon the throne. Hallelujah. So only by keeping that eternal end in mind will you and me have the strength and the courage to make it through. The Bible tells us that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. In other words, he had to keep eternity in mind, remembering the Bible says the joy that was set before him. So the question to you right now is, do you want things to get back to normal? Or is your heart's cry the same as Revelation 22? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I hope that is your prayer as well. Brethren, 
if you embrace this unique opportunity given to us by this COVID-19 and we run into God's presence, we get the opportunity to find out which of those God-given perspectives will need some stretching. And you're going to hear Father God ask, ask you one more time, do you really want Jesus to return? That's a question he's going to ask, not only corporately, but he's going to ask each person individually. Do you really want Jesus to return? This is what a Sabbath rest does for us. It gives us the ability to see clearly, to think proactively, and to act wisely in the midst of crisis as we change from a subjective lateral viewpoint to a vertical, biblical perspective where we see ourselves as God sees us. A view from the top, a view from where God sits, changes everything. And it comes from a place of Sabbath rest. You gain the perspective of past victories, present opportunities, and future eternal glory when you run into God's presence. As I close, the Bible says that the name of Jesus is a strong tower in which we can run into and be safe when we come into relationship with him through his finished work on Calvary. You listen to me right now and you have never asked Jesus to come into your life as Lord and Savior. There is no holo holo, no hocus pocus, nothing in this. All you've got to do is to willingly say, Lord Jesus, I heard that you died for my sins. Come into my life as my Lord and Savior. I need your resurrection life in me. Let's say that prayer. Say that prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and give me eternal life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the power of Holy Spirit to help us to bring about change in our lives through this message today. God, let your word bring us more and more into your resurrection life, Lord Jesus, as we crucify that old nature, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Let your kingdom come in us as it is in heaven. Thank you, God, that your purposes are being fulfilled every day in our lives, every moment of every day. And we are learning to willingly submit to you, to obey you, and walk in all of your will before we die. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace and your mercy. And we give you thanks and praise. Thank you, Lord. Now, I just want you to stand and receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you richly. See you next week.